Aquaponics, for those who don't know, is an international development consulting firm with uh, headquarters in the US and in the UK and with uh, activities uh, throughout the developing world. Um, before we launch in today's, into today's event, I did want to make a quick plug for a new program uh, that Commonics is implementing in partnership with USAID. Uh, this is the uh, Climate Finance for Development Accelerator, uh, which as the name suggests, is focused on climate finance and uh, attempting to pretty massively scale up the financial resources that are available to address the climate crisis. Uh, if you'd like more information on the program itself, you can find it on climatelinks.org at that URL at the bottom of the slide there. If you um, are a part of an organization that uh, would like to get involved in the program, either as you know, a potential investor, uh, an organization seeking investment, or uh, an organization that provides services you know, that are otherwise part of the climate finance ecosystem, like uh, you know, climate analysis or something else, uh, please uh, feel free to go to um, an intake form which, for which there is a QR code on a couple of uh, those stand-up kind of handouts at the back of the room uh, that you can scan, and that will take you to a form that you can uh, enter your information in uh, in order to uh, get into our partnership database. <clears throat> so without uh, further uh, discussion, and in the interest of time, uh, I will turn the uh, session over to the moderator, Max uh, McGrath-Horn, sitting here to my left. Uh, Max is uh, the senior uh, climate finance advisor at Commodics International within the climate group. Uh, the Climate Group is the organization within Commonics that is sponsoring uh, our program here. So with that, Max, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. And, uh, and thanks for being here. COP, um, especially this year, can be um, logistically challenging. And so we really appreciate that you made it a priority to come out and, and hear this session. I think you'll find it to be pretty uh, informative and interesting. Um, and certainly stick around after if you have any questions or, or want to chat further about these topics. Um, as Chris said, my name is Max McGrath Horn. I'm Commonics Senior Climate Finance Advisor. Just to frame the opportunity here a little bit um, and why I'm particularly excited, I think the panelists as well um, are excited about the opportunity in voluntary carbon markets. They're an incredible mechanism for driving finance and impact down to the community level for climate change, uh, as well as uh, climate adaptation and general development outcomes. Voluntary carbon markets are growing really rapidly. In 2019, voluntary carbon market transactions were around $320 million globally. In 2021, they passed $2 billion, and they're projected to increase anywhere from to, to sorry, five to $30 billion by, by 2030. So we're talking about potentially quite a lot of finance that can be used to address climate change and improve community um, development. Carbon markets you're likely aware um, have received some negative press coverage and um, as well here at this COP, we've seen a strong focus on um, not letting corporations uh, do greenwashing. And that's of course, extremely important. And so we really need to keep front and center here. Um, there, there is the possibility for this tool, the carbon market to be used in a way that can um, make it difficult for people to understand the real impacts that corporations are having if they're saying that they're reducing a certain amount of emissions, but really some of that's coming from offsets and they're not being transparent about that and the offsets aren't done well, that can be really problematic. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is how we can um, make sure that those programs are good and, and doing good and not helping corporations avoid um, their responsibility. And really over the last couple of decades, um, a lot has improved. Um, the markets have gotten quite a lot better. The standards have improved, methodologies are much more rigorous. The monitoring, reporting, and verification technology is much better. Um, so I think we need to recognize the, the, the major strides that have been made in carbon markets um, already. And when we discuss them, not think exclusively about the, the bad actors in the space, but try to have optimism um, and look at the positive things that are happening in this area. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, I don't want to shy away from those criticisms. So we're going to try to address them head on today. Um, and I want to... Um, 
define three terms before I hand it over to the panelists, again, to sort of set our baseline understanding what we're talking about. The first major challenge in voluntary carbon markets is additionality. Some projects, um, I think as we all understand, were set up in areas, particularly in forests, that weren't under real threat from deforestation or forest loss in other ways. So generating carbon credits from those projects um, didn't necessarily or probably likely did not bring um, the climate change impacts that they claimed to. And we really have to make sure that that's not happening. Um, Standard setters have gone a long way towards making sure that uh, additionality concerns are addressed in the project design. Um, we'll hear a little bit about that. But the question remains, um, how can we be sure that the reduced deforestation or increased sequestration would not have occurred without carbon finance? So that's a really key question. Uh, the second challenge is leakage. Um, the idea that if you set up protection in one territory under a project, um, that the deforestation activity will simply move outside of the project boundaries. Um, and then again, you won't really have reduced emissions. We'll still have those emissions. Um, so we need to ask um, on a large scale, um, you know, how can we address that challenge? For instance, if Costa Rica eliminates deforestation, um, can that activity simply move to Nicaragua and Panama? So this isn't just a, a program level or project level issue. It can be an issue at the scale of jurisdictions as well. Um, the third challenge is permanence. Nature-based solutions inherently are less permanent than some of the carbon dioxide removal CDR technology-based solutions um, that are coming in the market. Uh, they're still extremely uh, difficult to implement, these CDR technologies. Um, but when they are done, they promise to store this carbon for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And that's really the, the time scale that we do need carbon credits to, to operate on if they're going to uh, address the problem because carbon dioxide, as we know, can stay in the atmosphere for a thousand years. So um, the, the nature-based projects are threatened by forest fire, they're threatened by reversal at the community level. Maybe the incentives aren't set up correctly to keep the communities interested in, in protecting the forests. And so after we sell the credits, we could see the, a reversal. A final threat um, to permanence, um, which we'll talk about a little bit today, is uh, political will. We really need governments to continue to support these programs at all levels um, to, to make sure that carbon stays locked up in forests and that there aren't major reversals. Um, okay, so the last thing I wanna say about this before I turn it over to the panelists is um, carbon markets are an amazing tool. They're not a silver bullet. Um, they should not be used to let corporations off the hook for their um, deep decarbonization needs, um, but they also shouldn't be held responsible for doing that. Uh, managing private sector emissions is the role of government regulation and industry regulators. It's not tropical forest communities' job to regulate international corporations' emissions. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I'm gonna invite my colleague Roberto to walk us through some of the excellent work that he's doing with USAID. Thank you, Max. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, Max has mentioned some things that are very important. Uh, we will be talking in the whole panel about high-quality uh, carbon credits. And normally the quality of carbon credits has been related to issues like uh, additionality, the use of uh, credible and trustworthy standards, methodologies, baselines, and even registries. But sometimes when we're talking about uh, nature-based solutions and RED, we forget that one key factor is territorial governance. And it depends on the local communities, definitely because permanence depends basically on the, the existence of conditions of uh, territorial governance. So what I'm going to present today is an example from RED, but the lessons learned from that process can be applied to any other nature-based solutions. Um, you know, RED presents a series of opportunities for local communities, but those opportunities only will materialize uh, if the communities have the opportunity to participate in the whole process of implementing RED, in the process of choosing to definitely be involved in RED, in designing the initiative, implementing it, and monitoring it. It's, it's key that communities are always uh, involved in the implementation of RED. And that creates ownership of the RED initiative. And that ownership also allows the traditional uh, management strategies that farmers, indigenous people, Afro-Colombian people in the case 
that we, I'm going to present you to uh, are uh, incorporated in the design of the RED initiative. One thing that is important to say is that since 2012, uh, USAID has been involved in supporting what we call the BioRED portfolio. It's a series of eight projects in the Pacific coast of Colombia. Um, those eight projects were uh, developed in traditional territories of Afro-Colombian uh, people and also indigenous people in the five departments that form this, this region of Colombia. But uh, the model of the BioRed involved the continuous participation of international cooperation since 2012. And that's not sustainable in the long term, especially if we want to expand the effects of RED. So in this project that we have been working for the past two years and that we call Innovative Conservation Models for Paramos and Forest, what we have made is that we have built on the lessons learned from BioRed, but we have made some twists. We need to rely on the capacities of the private sector to develop red projects along with local communities and also to provide the financing required for the implementation of those of those initiatives so you know that in 2016 colombia had well finished or completed uh the peace dialogues with the former uh, far guerrilla and uh, the the country and the government sus subscribed a peace agreement that included the need to develop uh, local development initiatives for the regions that were mostly affected by the internal conflict in Colombia. We call those regions the PDET regions, P-D-E-T regions. But what we can say is that those are the regions that were most affected by the, by the conflict. And uh, part of what was agreed is that local communities in those regions would have the opportunity to develop a, uh, sorry, development plan, to formulate a development plan of their own, not one that is only formulated by local governments, but for but it was lo uh, formulated by local communities. And many of those communities said in, in those initiatives they wanted to implement that they knew they had an opportunity on uh, the for in the, on the forest in their territory, that they knew they had an economic opportunity to develop some say uh, carbon uh, forest carbon projects. Others say they wanted to sell oxygen. That's uh, a, a very normal confusion in in, in the regular uh, talking of the communities. Um, some others say that they wanted uh, payment for environmental services schemes. But anyway, they had the impression that they could make a, a way of living from the forest. So with the participation, well, USA, with the participation of well, the ART, that is a governmental agency called the Agency for Territorial Renovation, decided that we could work in some of these PEDET regions in Colombia. And, we, and they selected six of those regions two located on the Pacific coast, once again, another two in the Amazon, and additional, uh, two additional ones in uh, the northeastern Andes of Colombia. But they selected the regions, they selected the territories that maybe had the best potential to develop red projects, but it was, until that point, on the government side. So what we decided to do in, in this project with uh, USF funding was to put the communities, the local communities at the center of the whole process. So maybe we could identify the territories and regions with the biggest potential for red, but we didn't know if local communities were definitely interested in such a mechanism. First thing that we found is that people were not aware of what red was. They didn't have any idea of that. They, they were talking about things like selling oxygen, not selling carbon credits, yeah? Or some others thought that RED included selling the forest or selling the water, something that could be a, uh, a threat to uh, their livelihoods, to the integrity of their territories. 
So uh, in that sense, we decided that the first thing we had to do was train those communities to create the capacities, the required capacities to make the decision of whether or not participate in bread projects. So we started working with uh, 14 communities in these six regions. We had a, a, an extensive training with those communities. And at the end of the training, where we, we were working with them to learn uh, what was red, what was the relationship of red to territorial governance, uh, what were the opportunities, but also the challenges of red? They, uh, we consulted them, and they decided if it, they wanted to. Okay, this sounds interesting. We can go on with possibly a red project. Let's collect the information that we require to evaluate the potential of a project in our territory. And from those fourteen communities, ten said yes. Let's go on. Let's move on and try to, to make the, the required studies to define that. Um, at every single step of the process, we were consulting the communities to know if they were interested in participating in the next phase of the project. We always mentioned from the beginning that in the end, it was not USAID who was going to finance for or to, or to pay for the development of a red project, that in the end, we, 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 uh, it would be required that this, the private sector should be involved in the, in the development, the technical development, and also the financing of those red projects. So everything was uh, fully informed. Every time we were asking for consent. And in the end, we could uh, finally develop six uh, pre-feasibility studies for red projects and to get the money to uh, develop some additional four studies that are going to be developed, not by USAID. Well, you know, all the projects have restrictions, budget restrictions. Uh, so we had to get some additional money to, the, to complete the expectations of four additional communities. What is important is that we provided uh, sufficient and transparent information to local communities. We asked for consent in every step of the process, and we made the training and the capacity building required to make informed decisions. The final part of this process was maybe the most tricky, but also innovative, because normally communities are approached by uh, private stakeholders to propose a negotiation. There's a, bilateral negotiation where local communities are a little bit blind. They don't know exactly what they're getting involved in, they're getting engaged in. But here we changed the things. What we made is that we gave the information, the basic information of the pre-feasibility studies to these private stakeholders. We asked them what, which one of those territories they were interested in and so we had a set of, depending on the territory, between three and 11 private companies interested in developing and financing red projects in, in those territories. Um, so the next phase is, what are we going to do with 11 companies interested in developing a red project? When normally they get one by one, they convince uh, the, the authorities, the local authorities, and, and that's the end of it. Sometimes even they bribe the local authorities to get a signature on an agreement. So we didn't want that to happen. We wanted to support the autonomy of the communities. We wanted to support the capacity of making informed decisions, and we wanted the private sector stakeholders to consider communities not as beneficiaries, but as partners and the main partners of red projects because they are the ones who own the territory, who own the land. They are the ones who can reduce deforestation. And so they are the ones that can get the carbon credits uh, generated 
Otherwise, if, if they're not involved, fully involved, the whole community, not only the authorities, not the, one, not the guy who signs the, uh, the agreement, uh, it won't be successful at all. So we decided to have local meetings in every single territory. We took the three, six, or nine companies to the local territory, and we made them present a proposal, a proposal to the, te to the, the local authorities, and the authorities had the opportunity to compare the different models of intervention. The uh, authorities had the opportunity to compare the income they would receive as owners of the territory if they were to, to choose some of these uh, private stakeholders. And we are in the process of those local communities to make a final decision of what is the the best partner for the development of, of those projects. Um, it has been very interesting because we have had the opportunity to develop financial analysis of every, every one of those single uh, offers, of those single proposals, and to present it to the authorities and to tell them, well, if, because everyone presents their proposal in, in a very different way. Yeah, and if it's not that simple for us who are used to work in the red environment, you can imagine what it is for a local authority, for a, an indigenous uh, cabildo, that is the name that the, the, the authorities receive in, in Colombia, uh, of trying to understand what has been presented and what is the difference between one model and the other? What are the implications of being paid, I don't know, 60% upfront uh, or being paid after the credits are sold and uh, to discount the, the, the cost of the, the, the activities implementation. That is not simple. So we made it simple for them. We developed this comparative analysis of the whole proposals, but we insisted on one, one thing that is important. The partner that they choose should not be selected only on the basis of the financial offer. They need to have reliable partners. They need to have partners that are working with them in a balanced relationship uh, with respect for uh, environmental and social safeguards for them. And so it should be a set of criteria to make a decision of who they will be working with. In the end, we are in, the, in that point of the process, as I told you, where we are going to, where they are going to select their partners for red. But we had so far um, learned a lot in this process. In the end, we have been able to guarantee um, that communities are completely considered, I insist, as partners of the business, as the main partners of the business. We have been able to. Uh, protect the traditional decision-making processes of those communities. And every single community has a different decision-making process. So we have been able to do that. We, are, we have um, been able also to make the private stakeholders to think about their business proposals, their own models. Why are they offering 60% or 4% of the total income uh, of the total revenues of the project. They, ha they have had to think about that because communities have made really hard questions about those models to understand why they're being proposed that. What? Okay, now, final idea. <laughs> Thank you. Final idea. Um, we also have been able to contribute to the implementation of the peace agreements. And that's something that for us is very important. RED is also a way of building on the life plans of local communities and helping them develop in the way they want to, to reduce conflicts, conflicts with nature, conflicts with other communities, and to be able, able to build territorial peace. So I leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, okay. yes. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Vera, perhaps I'll start with providing a bit of an intro uh, to the organization. So we were founded in 2007 by um, environmental and business leaders who saw 
sort of the need for greater quality uh, assurance in the voluntary carbon market. So we operate the Verified Carbon Standard or VCS program, which is the world's largest GHG crediting uh, program. And I'm excited to share that we're at the cusp right now of uh, issuing our billionth credit. So that should happen later this week and hopefully the news will come out um, at that time. So we're getting very close. Um, the goal of the BCS program is really to ensure the credibility of the emission reduction and removal credits that are generated or under our program. And I would say that one of the strengths of the BCS is sort of the diversity of nature-based solution opportunities that we credit under our program. Um, we define rules and requirements that projects must follow to receive certification. And this is how we sure ensure that the, the credits are of high quality. Um, so for the purpose of this panel, I thought I'd focus on just like a couple of those quality criteria, namely permanence and additionality. So first, I wanted to talk a little bit about permanence, since it's especially relevant to nature-based solution projects in particular, and it's something that I spend a lot of time on. So uh, it's familiar with me. So all um, VCS projects with reversal risk, uh, and by reversal risk, I mean a risk that, you know, once... Yeah, let's see, trees have been planted, they can be burned down and that carbon's released back to the atmosphere, have to contribute a portion of their credits to um, our, our pooled buffer account. So the way we determine how many credits are, are put into that account is based on a risk assessment that all projects have to do uh, up front. And they look at risk in three categories, internal risk, which would include things like their project management capacity, External risk might look at things like political risk in the geography where you're working, um, and then natural risk, which is the one that we talk about the most, which includes things like uh, fires. So I'd say on average that about 20% of the credits go into the buffer account um, associated with our projects, and that's to cover the risk over 100 years of any loss events occurring. Uh, then if, the loss, if a loss does occur, the projects need to report it to us within two years. Um, and then at their next verification period, we determine if there's been a net reversal. So by net reversal, I mean that they have not generated enough credits in that um, monitoring period to compensate for that loss themselves, in which case it has to go to the buffer and we cancel credits to, to fully cover that loss. So um, the buffer basically acts like an insurance mechanism. And I think it's worth noting, um, because there is so much concern on permanence right now, that today there's actually only been one reversal event within the VCS program. It was not due to fire, it was due to uh, harvesting on an agroforestry project. So next I wanted to speak a little bit about um, additionality. So as Max was saying, all, all sort of credible carbon offset standards have rules and requirements for, for demonstrating a project is additional or wouldn't have happened in the absence of the project. So. Uh, within the VCS program, we outline how additionality has to be addressed at the methodology level. And there's a, a few different approaches that you can take uh, when you're developing a methodology, but I'll just mention one, uh, which is a performance method, because we're increasingly trying to push our projects to use this approach. So using this approach, there's some sort of threshold that the projects need to perform or outperform in order to, to generate credits. So Maybe I'll use an example. Right now we're in the process of developing an afforestation, reforestation, revegetation methodology that uh, basically the way it'll work is that um, projects will have to identify a set of control sites uh, that are comparable to the project region and they're gonna match them uh, based on a set of similarity criteria. And for productive forest systems, um, they will then have to compare what's happening in those control sites against what happens in the project. In order for the project to receive any credits, it has to outperform what's happening in the absence of the project. So it's a dynamic baseline approach that takes away some of the certainty, unfortunately, for the projects, but it gives us confidence or greater confidence that those credits are additional um, to, to what have, would have happened in the absence of the project. So maybe I'll stop there and some of the rules and requirements. Overall, we've got a lot of them if you've worked on developing a project within the VCS program. Um, you know, on top of this, maybe the one thing I will mention is that all projects are audited by third-party independent auditors to make sure that they meet to our requirements. Um, so to wrap up, maybe I just wanted to emphasize uh, nature-based solutions, uh, you know, developing or developed following credible standards, I think are, are robust. They deliver immediate reductions and removals while also creating so many benefits. You know, there's enhancing adaptation, protecting biodiversity, helping generate sustainable livelihoods for the communities. 
And there is absolutely no way to get to 1.5 without nature-based solutions. So, um, you know, for this reason, we're working hard at Vera to find ways to scale well-established nature-based solutions and also to drive investment into new activities like biochar or seaweed farming that we see as important, important climate solutions as well. Thanks. Thank you. That's such a good point. There is no way to get there. I mean, we know this from the models, right? You have to have nature-based solutions in there to get to these, uh, to get to 1.5. Anyway, thank you. I just want to stress that point. It's a really good one. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you, Max. Uh, thanks to Monix for this invitation, for the idea of this, this uh, session uh, with these wonderful speakers by my side. Um, very timely. And uh, my comments will be focused really on uh, work happening in the Amazon. Um, I like to think at the broadest level about nature-based solutions. Mother Nature today is absorbing about half of our carbon pollution and about a, a, half of that is in the terrestrial vegetation space and the other half is in oceans. And I think at its broadest framing, the challenge of nature-based solutions is really to secure and expand those stocks, those terrestrial vegetation and soil stocks. And the idea that this is untested, that somehow nature-based solutions lead to squishy, ephemeral uh, benefits for climate is, I think, preposterous, uh, just given the scale of what Mother Nature is already doing. Um, I'd like to drill in a little bit today on the case of the Amazon, which is one piece of that global uh, sink that's yanking a quarter of all emissions out of the atmosphere each year, and ask, could, could high quality credits be a game changer? And the answer is yes, and because of several opportunities that are coming together. And I, I, I also want to leave you with the notion that, as my good friend William Boyd likes to say, living carbon is the most difficult piece of the global current climate solution that we need. And it's also the most important because there's so many other things that are tied up in living carbon. So back to my days as an ecologist torturing Amazon forests with fire, with drought, uh, it, uh, that means I got to climb a lot of trees and set a lot of things on fire, which is a wonderful pastime. But uh, the Amazon is teetering at the edge of the amount of rainfall it needs to remain a, a rainforest. Uh, the, rain, the dry season in Mato Grosso, where a lot of my research has been, is almost a month longer than it used to be. And that's where we're down to about 60% of the original forest. There's a very strong scientific a base for saying we need an 80% forest cover, not just in the aggregate, but in individual landscapes to keep the Amazon intact. And that alone is an incredibly important challenge because the trees, the wood of Amazon trees is equivalent to about a decade's worth of, of global emissions. Um, and the, the rate at which those emissions leak out into the atmosphere will determine the significance of national efforts towards their NDCs and the Amazon could easily erase the progress made by a couple of dozen smaller economies or medium economies. The, um, so what's happening in the Amazon is, yes, there's the chainsaw deforestation that is rising. And beyond that, there is something called the forest dieback that has started. And when you get really severe droughts, the usually fire tolerant forests are becoming vulnerable to, to fire. The fire moves in, kills a lot of trees, lets sun demanding uh, grasses move in, and you've got a, a vicious downward spir spiral of forest carbon. And um, <clears throat> Now to the positive side, there's three opportunities that are coming together that could allow us to achieve that 80% minimum forest cover goal for the Amazon, just as an illustration of how to deal with one of the great terrestrial carbon sinks in the world. The first of these is subnational low emission development strategies. Members of the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force, which was created in 2009 in anticipation of the International Offset Provision of, of California's Global Warming Solutions Act, which gave us the California Tropical Forest Standard, but never gave us the regulations because of 
a lot of criticisms based upon some bad carbon projects out there aimed at, at this uh, framework. Um, so the states didn't stop, the provinces didn't stop. These are, they cover about a third of the world's tropical forests are members of the Governor's Climate Forest Task Force. Every one of them has a low emission development strategy. Every one of them recently signed off for reducing deforestation at least 80% by 2030. Every one of them has an investment plan. Some are better than others. They're ready to go. And the important thing is they brought different stakeholders to the table. And uh, we know we, we, we supported 10 of these uh, 33 strategies. And they're amazing. It's getting people to talk together uh, who have no tradition of talking to each other. And as Roberto points out, it's all about territorial governance. That is the secret, in our view, to long-term, uh, durable, uh, nature-based solutions. The second opportunity are, is the carbon market. It's what we're here to discuss. Uh, right now, all nine mem uh, states of the Brazilian Amazon have formally registered their interest in selling credits from their jurisdictional red programs. A jurisdictional red program is different than a project in that the boundaries are politically relevant boundaries. So these are first tier subnational uh, jurisdictions. And we've got 60% of the Amazon in the Brazilian states that want to get this done. Uh, I was just at a meeting this morning. We've been one year helping uh, one of those states negotiate a major uh, deal that would basically inject a few hundred million dollars into its statewide uh, strategy beginning in 2023 with potentially another billion or so coming in over the next 10 years. So this is, I would say, finally getting to the scale of carbon finance we need to do what the goal of jurisdictional red is, which is to push a region towards a new rural development paradigm. So it's not paying people not to clear forests, it's funding a new development paradigm, which is forest friendly. The third piece is really uh, the growing interest among impact investors, philanthropists, mainstream investors, pension fund investors, seeing, wanting to be a part of a positive story especially in iconic places like the Amazon or Congo or Borneo. Or, and we recently uh, became the host of something called the Amazon Investor Coalition. 400 impact investors, philanthropists, companies wanting to invest in the Amazon. And uh, so I think to wrap up here, what is needed to move forward? Uh, first of all, we need a growing voluntary carbon market that leads as a stepping stone to the eventual compliance market under Article 6. I am bewildered by the statements made that somehow this could let companies off the hook. We've got to kill it now. Um, yes, we have to make sure that the credits are have really high quality. We have to make sure it's not letting companies off the hook. But on the other hand, if companies are putting lots of money into a new rural development paradigm in the tropics, man, that's what we need. That should be recognized and rewarded without letting them off the hook, of course. We need upfront funding. There's a potential here for a virtuous cycle of funding leading to emissions reductions, leading to even more funding, and we won't get that flywheel spinning unless we have adequate upfront finance. Uh, that's a, a fascinating thing of these negotiations we're supporting. The company is doing advanced purchases of future credits, injecting some money into those jurisdictional red programs to get the flywheel rolling. And finally, we need to connect all of these investors, philanthropists, companies who, who want to be part of a success story with these jurisdictional strategies, because that's where you tie into governance to the power of the law enforcement efforts, the, the policy making efforts, the convening power, you know, roads and infrastructure that only governments have, not only, but where they, they control most, most of it. So um, I will stop there and just say, remember nature, mother nature is ready to do her part even more. And I think the voluntary carbon market and high quality credits is a big part of that.
Thank you. Thanks to all of you. We, um, we have a lot of questions from everyone out here, which is excellent. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to ask um, a couple of questions that I have um, first, if you guys don't mind. Um, but I'll ask you all to be very brief in your answers so that we can get to the audience questions as well. Um, luckily, one of the um, audience questions actually aligns with something that, that I also was going to ask. So we can um, do a double here. <laughs> Um, but um, I think maybe I'll ask Dan if you could address this. We'll go right back to you. Um, is there a risk uh, that indigenous people will once again be excluded from, from these transactions as, as they have historically been? Yeah, I think we should look at the historical examples of how indigenous people have been included in jurisdictional programs. The state of Acre is clearly the front runner. Uh, we did a an investigation with Indigenous Peoples Own Organizations of how that program was seen. And the response that came back was the main thing, the benefit they saw was having a seat at the public policy table. So it was inclusion. They also appreciated the benefits. The second major experiment in Mato Grosso, $50 million euros, um, about 11 million going to Indigenous people. Every one of 84 tribes in Mato Grosso had COVID uh, help with dealing with COVID, um, among other benefits. If anything, they, they think there needs to be more money going that way. And uh, so I think there's good historical evidence that if they are involved, as Roberto said so eloquently, from the very start as proponents of the program and not sort of down, downstream uh, beneficiaries, we'll get this right. Um. Thank you. And, and Candace, I have a question for you, um, which, is, which is a question of mine. Um, but you know, we hear this term that the, the carbon, voluntary carbon markets are the Wild West like quite frequently in the news. And I don't agree with that necessarily. I think there are, like, we've been explaining a lot of regulations now and improving methodologies. Um, but nonetheless, that perception is a driving force um, in sort of public uh, criticism. In many ways, VERA and the other standard setters in the voluntary carbon market will need to play an even bigger role going forward in making sure that those criticisms don't, uh, let's say, become reality or, or aren't proven to be true all the time. What do you see as VERA's role in, in making sure that happens? And, and what do you think standard setters like VERA can do to continue to improve the legitimacy of the voluntary carbon market? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, I think to start, you know, as the largest voluntary carbon market standard, I think we're conscious of the fact that our actions set sort of the tone uh, for others. And we take that with, uh, you know, a lot of responsibility that comes with that. Um, you know, I think as an independent principles, nonprofit organization, um, this is, you know, it's important to our integrity to make sure that it's not seen as the, the Wild West. I think it's important to note that we're not sort of beholden to any donor or interest group um, and our survival really depends on us defining rules that are, are highly, have high integrity so that the buyers continue to want credits that are certified under our program. Um, I would say that continuous improvement is certainly part of our, our work uh, and something that we're always striving to use the latest science and technology and maybe just to, to give a couple examples. Um, on permanence, because I was speaking about permanence earlier, we are soon going to be announcing that we're developing a long-term monitoring system that will use remote sensing to monitor projects over the long term um, so that we can detect reversals um, more actively, more real time, and change the way uh, we look at how we um, quantify uh, risk and also to cancel credits after, after projects stop monitoring based on observed losses instead of just at the end of the post-crediting period. So, um, that's one thing that we're doing on the technology side. I think on the scientific side, we are we have a Seascapes Carbon Initiative where we're working with academics and scientists to look at some of the latest opportunities and in, in ocean crediting opportunities to make sure that we're sort of at the forefront of defining maybe what research questions need to be answered so that we can um, fill those research gaps thinking about the future state. Some more sort of immediate things, we've updated our methodology development and review process um, that now every five years we're committing to reviewing all of our methodologies to see if they're still additional and whether or not we should continue to credit projects under, under those methodologies. So that's another thing that we've done towards continuous improvement. There's a lot more I could probably go on, but I'll stop there. 
Uh, thank you for that. And I, I, um, I think that's a really good answer. And it also kind of touches on another question we have in here, which is about um, uh, what other kinds of nature-based solutions outside of forest. We have talked a lot about forest today. Um, but before we ask that question to anybody, I have a question um, that I wanted to ask to you, Roberto, um, which was, how can you use this model outside of the regions where you have already implemented it? I mean, are the are the characteristics of these PDETs unique, or could what you're doing be applied in other jurisdictions, other in other product areas? Thank you. No, it's it's perfectly it's perfectly possible to implement the same model in other regions. The PDETs have the, the only thing that makes them special is that they were very affected by the conflict. What is interesting is that those regions match almost perfectly the most biodiverse zones in areas in Colombia and the presence of traditional communities. But we have uh, regions that are not included in those PDETs. I think these PDETs cover, uh, one, if I don't remember, the, the, if I remember well, the figure is like 180 municipalities of Colombia, and we have 1,100 municipalities. So we still have a 900 universe that where you can implement this. Of course, if there is no presence of a traditional uh, communities like indigenous people or Afro-Colombian, it will be a little bit harder because you will have to deal with a lot of people, farmers. Yeah, but we have the potential to also improve the livelihoods of farmers that sometimes have been left away uh, aside of the of the this, these opportunities. So I think we have the opportunity. The, the, what is important is that we respect the, the main principles that we have established. And I think it could be implemented in, not even in Colombia, not only in Colombia, but in other countries, of course. I'm gonna pass this mic right, I'm gonna pass this mic right back to you because um, the top question we have here um, to address still is, uh, why, why thousands of years? Um, and maybe I'll, I'll get all three of you to chime in on this actually. Why are we talking about thousands of years? Why are the CDR folks talking about thousands of years when action is required now? I mean, isn't the value, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit of this question, but isn't the value of uh, 50 years of removal that happens now much bigger than the value of a thousand year removal that, that doesn't take place for the next few decades? So maybe we could actually, if you don't mind me, I'll start with Dan and then we could get everybody to chime in. I'm baffled by that, that uh, argument. <laughs> it's, uh, I've always thought that 100 years is too much. We need to think in terms of public policy relevant time scales and not back away from the central role nature-based solutions have. You know, I, I'm, I'm the first to say we've got to speed the transition of fossil fuels uh, away from fossil fuels. But nature-based solutions, it's not like they're this distant, you know, half-breed cousin that we should ignore and put in the corner. They're mainstream, and if, if we, we're keeping carbon in those ecosystems a few decades longer, that is a huge win, because that alone reduces the risk of further, further climate change. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that? Sure. Maybe, yeah, perspective there. Yeah, I mean, I think that the reason why the thousand number figure comes out is because from a purely scientific perspective, the length of time that CO2 stays in the atmosphere is, you know, 300 to 1,000 years, depending on the situation. So um, I think that's why some folks refer to, to that number, uh, because credits are used to, to compensate for emissions. Um, but I totally agree with Dan. I mean, the reality of the situation that we're facing right now is there's urgency um, and we need to act now and we cannot allow sort of this fear of the unknown stop us from taking action in the immediate term. Um, and at a bare minimum, you know, this is going to buy us time to figure out other solutions. And I think that um, it's distracting from the, the core issue and the immediate issue that we need to, to deal with right now. Sure. Yeah, please. I would love to point out that, well, it makes things a little bit complicated when we talk about this time span, because local communities do not have the capacity sometimes to plan in the long term. They can make plans at, I don't know, five, 10 years, but when you start to, to, to make them think about 30 years, 50 years, it's like, what? Uh, I don't know if I will be alive. How can I plan this territory? How can I plan the activities I'm going to, to implement in, in, in 50 years? So it complicates a little bit things. And I think that's something that should be uh, addressed somehow because 
they are the key factor to the permanence of the of the the carbon emission reductions and uh, it's yeah it's something that, that that should be somehow thought of and, and, and addressed in sometimes standards and methodologies do not consider that way of thinking of, of local communities i'm just going to be loud and leave the mic here in the middle for you guys i, I think everyone can hear me yeah, okay great thanks um Okay, here's another one from the audience, um, and it, it's for you, Candice. Uh, what type of work is Vera doing to scale nature-based solutions? Are you looking into implementing IoT and remote sensing um, measurement techno geeks, it says here. <laughs> one of you has it's good lingo. Yeah, so we, I mean, we've got a lot of things going on to scale nature-based solutions. I mentioned the Seascape Carbon Initiative, and that's focused on activities like seaweed farming, avoided bottom trolling, seaweed sinking. Um, so we've got a group of stakeholders that we're working on to explore those opportunities. On the agriculture side, we're looking at fertilizer management, soil sequestration, enhanced weathering, um, you know, rice methane. There's a whole bunch of solutions that we've got teams that are working on. Um, there's a specific part to that question that related to technology. Right, yeah, to IoT and remote sensing. Yeah, um, okay, so we have a digital MRV working group that's looking at how we're going to enhance use of some of these technologies within the VCS program and how we can use them to streamline um, project development. And in an ideal world, if we can get there, the vision is, is that eventually maybe we can have platforms that depend on IoT devices um, that bring together the data, automate the quantification, and you could all even have an automated verification once you certified that that platform was working correctly. Of course, with nature-based solutions, that's very complicated. You need to think about um, some of the social benefits, uh, and even, even within the carbon quantification, not every single variable in the quantification approach can necessarily be automated at this point, but that's sort of the vision that we're working towards, and we've got a digital MRV working group that's uh, working with us to start to carve out what the path is to that future state. Um, awesome. Can you pass the mic down to, to Roberto and we'll get one more question in because we're basically at time here. But Roberto, so the top question on Slido here was what about wetlands? And I, I know that Potamos uh, and, and Forests did some of that work. So maybe you could address that. Yes. Uh, in wetlands, we have some uh, pretty good examples in Colombia right now, uh, especially in coastal uh, wetlands and mangroves in the Caribbean coast. There is, I think, one of the pioneering projects in, in this kind of ecosystems. And one thing that is important, and it, it underlines the importance of local governance, is that uh, coastal wetlands and wetlands in general belong to the nation, are um, what we call public lands. They don't belong to the people, but people use, it, use, it, use those ecosystems. So it's very important to establish uh, a set of rules for the management of, the, of those uh, spaces. In the case of Paramos and Forest, we haven't been working on coastal wetlands. We have been working on high mountain uh, wetlands with very high uh, contents of carbon. But we are still developing the basic information to be able to develop carbon credits in those kind of ecosystems. Uh, the transformation of those ecosystems um, depends also on the use that local communities make of, the, of them. So it's, it's always important to, to keep in mind that uh, local communities are the key factor to, to those ecosystems. We have developed uh, relevant information, baseline information that we require, but it's not enough. So far, we have to understand the processes of transformation of those ecosystems to be able to develop any uh, any carbon cre uh, carbon project in in, in wetlands. Well, I, I, I'm going to end it there. Um, thank you so much to the panelists. Really.